This evening, we're going to be pleased to hear from Robert D. Griffiths. Uh, he's retired from the Foreign Service, worked for 34 years uh, for the State Department. Uh, he, his rank was of a minister counselor. He is currently an instructor in Chinese politics at the University of Utah at BYU. Previously, Griffiths taught economics and Chinese studies at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. During his 34-year career with the U.S. Department of State, he lived and worked in Greater China for 14 years, most recently as U.S. Consul General in Shanghai from 2011 to 2014, with early, earlier postings abroad in Beijing, Bangkok, ta Taipei, Kaohsiung, and Bogota. I hope I pronounced Kaohsiung right. So, so this is an amazing evening, as have all of our lectures been. Uh, I hope you have a lot of questions. This is all about China and um, the Orient and the State Department. And uh, we welcome Robert D. Griffiths. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I should probably uh, point out that I'm probably misrepresenting a career in the State Department a little bit this evening by not wearing a tie. Because it is one of those few remaining professions where at least when you're working in Washington and in an embassy overseas, you can expect if you're a guy to be wearing a tie and if you're a woman to be dressed very professionally. Casual has not caught on yet in the State Department, but it may someday. Okay, well the State Department, as you know, is part of the executive branch of the government. The President of the United States is by a constitutional authority in charge of foreign policy. But as a practical matter, it's the Department of State that heads up that effort. In doing so, we work closely with the National Security Council, the Department of Defense, the CIA, and a number of other agencies that are involved in doing work abroad, which involves nowadays almost all government agencies, but certainly departments of Treasury, Justice, Agriculture, Homeland Security, and Commerce, just to name a few. And if I can get the technology right, we'll have a great evening here. There, I think we're doing okay. So you can see this little um, uh, cartoon from Dilbert, um, sort of trying to figure out what diplomacy is really all about. As you, as you study that for a minute, let me give you my definition of what diplomacy is. And this is something that applies uh, very seriously in international relations and in all the way down to relations with your in-laws. And the definition is, diplomacy is the art of making it as easy as possible for the other guy to do the right thing. And so that's how I approach diplomacy and how I think it really plays out in the world when it's effective. Too often we confuse diplomacy or, we, or people think of diplomats as sort of wimps because they don't really tell it like it is. Well, the diplomats are well aware of what it really is, but the objective here isn't to satisfy your ego in saying what you really think about something, it's to get results that are good for your country and your cause, and that often involves not getting the other side to get their backs up because you're insulting them by telling them what you really think about them. So, diplomacy is the art of making it as easy as possible for the other guy to do the right thing. All right, getting a little more formal here for the State Department. The mission is, and this is a quote from an official document. Oh, you can't see it yet, I'm working on that, good. To shape and sustain a peaceful, peaceful, prosperous, just, and democratic world and foster conditions for stability and progress for the benefit of the American people and people everywhere. Okay, the Department of State is the first federal agency established under the Constitution. That was in July 1789. Benjamin Franklin was the first American diplomat. Thomas Jefferson first served as the first department, as first Secretary of State. When he took office, he had a staff of one chief clerk, three assistant clerks, a translator, and a messenger. And he was able to do his work with such a small staff because we only had two overseas diplomatic posts, Paris and London, 
and then we had 10 consular posts, which generally served seamen in ports of call abroad. Now, why am I telling you this? It's because nowadays, and particularly recently, people are talking about shrinking government and doing away with agencies. Well, I'm happy to announce that to do it with the State Department, you'd have to go back and rewrite the Constitution. So we think we're pretty safe, and that should mean job security if you join the State Department, because you have to have changed the Constitution to get rid of us. All right. Let's see. There. Okay. Our goals at the State Department directly affect the American people. Some, some have the notion that um, you know, we're out there interacting with foreigners and, you know, we really care about foreigners and we don't really care about Americans and somehow we're not related. It's really not the case. In particular, people are worried about foreign aid. Um, I, at one point, helped administer an anti-drug program in Thailand. And the, the objective in those days, we had a lot of heroin coming out of the Golden Triangle and we helped them eradicate the heroin there because heroin is a lot easier to eradicate when it's in the ground in poppy form and a lot tougher to eradicate by the time it hits the streets of New York. So we worked with the Thai authorities to try and eradicate the, the opium there. It was a much more efficient way to use tax dollars to deal with the war on drugs as we were fighting at that point than in any other way. Um, in doing so, we obviously have to work closely with the foreign governments, and we have to maintain a good working relationship with them, even if it sometimes is frustrating because they don't act and behave the way we would like them to, or they perhaps don't have the exact same goals that we do. But in any case, we are working for the American people. That is our job, and we don't forget that. Anyway, some of the things we do for Americans, we create jobs through promotion of open markets. Some 20 million U.S. jobs are supported through foreign trade and some of the different um, things that we have done. We work behind the scenes. For example, we protect intellectual property in working with foreign governments. We negotiate airline routes when you fly around the, on, around the world. That wasn't a commercial decision that an airline made unless we have already negotiated and what we call open skies agreement. Otherwise, all of these routes are negotiated by the State Department in conjunction with the Department of Transportation. Both sides do it. We have fishery treaties worldwide and um, in so many ways we work to support U.S. business and U.S. exports abroad. We do the most sort of emotional and impactful work that we do is when we help American citizens who get into trouble overseas. Um, this might mean visiting them in jail in the worst case, or it might mean uh, doing a variety of other things. Let me tell you one story. Um, when we are, uh, if you call an American facility overseas 24 seven, you'll always get somebody, a human being at the other end of the line. And that is because obviously when we're at work that we have people who are, whose job it is. And even when we're, the embassy is not open, there's always a duty officer on call. Once when I was a duty officer, we had a woman call and she was kind of frantic. She had been in country just a few days on a tourist trip with her husband and her husband had had a heart attack. And she was just frantic, didn't know what to do. Um, I was able to direct her to a hospital where I knew she would get excellent care um, and where they spoke enough English that she would be able to take care of them and uh, got her there at the hospital. Knowing, however, that this was such a traumatic experience for her that simply taking care of her basic needs really wasn't enough, I reached out and found a member of our community in the embassy who was a nurse, and a, tra a trained nurse, and asked her if she would be willing to go to the hospital and 
spend the day with this woman while her husband was in open heart surgery so that she would have an American there, somebody who could be a friend whose, whose shoulder she could lean on. And um, she did that. And it was a wonderful experience for the, my friend, the nurse, to serve in that way. And later on, as you can imagine, the, the wife was extremely grateful for that effort that had been done. You don't always have those sorts of resources available, but I can assure you that when we're overseas, we're looking after American citizens and we want to help as much as we can. Sometimes people want things that we can't deliver. Someone gets arrested and they have this notion that if the embassy will just weigh in, we can pop them out of jail and, and send them home. We can't. If you go overseas, you're subject to the laws of that country, just like when foreigners come to the United States, we expect them to be subject to the laws of the United States. But we will work hard to make sure that you get fair treatment, um, both in the legal system and in, um, uh, in jail. Some places, jails require people to bring in uh, food and other things for them, and we do that sort of thing. We spend a lot of time visiting Americans in jail in places where Sometimes the conditions aren't so good, and sometimes where they just need little support and help. We promote democracy. We truly believe that the world is going to be a safer place when citizens have a say in their own governance, because most people do not want to go to war, and sometimes, and Generally speaking, democracies do not go to war with each other. Let's see. I could give you some statistics, but you probably aren't into that. We work on non-proliferation programs, destroying stockpiles of missiles, nuclear weapons, and nuclear material. We have helped 40 countries clear millions of square meters of landmines. We also work to protect uh, health around the world. One of the earliest jobs I had was um, in the beginnings of the AIDS crisis when it was not well understood. Um, I was posted to Thailand where the uh, AIDS epidemic was raging seemingly out of control. And it was, it was a very interesting uh, job that I had working with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, which had set up offices there to do epidemiolo epidemiological studies on the, on the disease. And it was in that office where they developed the vaccine. They were doing a trial on mother to infant transmission of AIDS. And they had a product. These trials usually, I don't know if you're familiar with the trials, but they take a long time to make sure they're done well. But this trial showed so much promise right early on that they discontinued the trial and approved the drug, and it became one of the most effective ways early on before there was a cure for AIDS, or at least a management protocol for it, that they were able to um, prevent one of the main avenues of transmission for the drug. We, um, when you're overseas, sometimes you end up working 24-7, and sometimes that can be something as, as uh, challenging as hosting a congressional delegation who's running around the city. Sometimes it's very bad news, an airplane crash, a disaster, and we immediately spring into action first and foremost to um, see what American citizens might have been involved and what assistance they might need. Um, we also work closely with the host government to see what assistance we might be able to provide. And because of the extensive reach of the U.S. military, we often are able to bring in military ships to provide aid in places where it, they can't get aid otherwise. For example, in the tsunami of 2004, um, there was um, uh, places in Malaysia where the roads had been completely cut off and they had no access to the normal routes of supply. And the U.S. military, arranged in conjunction with the State Department, working with the government, was able to bring in boats and offload supplies that, that saved those people. That, that sort of thing helps turn around 
public opinion in foreign countries, when we're able to demonstrate that we truly are there to help to the extent that we can. In a more longer term thing, we work closely with the Department of Agriculture to promote um, crops and the best sorts of ways to do agriculture. Uh, we also work with closely with USAID and sort of uh, in, in different ways that we can promote uh, foreign assistance in ways that's helpful to them. We promote the rule of law and protect human dignity. Um, we perfect, try to weigh in and protect prisoners of conscience by speaking out and shining a light on things that uh, are, are amiss in terms of violation of human rights. Um, I also work closely with um, anti-human trafficking programs overseas and uh, work to coordinate the U.S. effort with the local effort there and make sure that both were mutually supportive and to help promote understanding back in Washington of the conditions on the ground there and the ways that they could really provide assistance that would be most efficacious and not just satisfy the political needs in Washington as they were viewed from that, that perspective. As a practical matter, you will probably have your first interaction with the State Department when you apply for a passport. We issue all passports. In 2014, sorry, it's a little bit dated, we issued 14 million passports to Americans to travel overseas. And uh, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of passports. And so <laughs> if you think it's a little slow, that's why. <laughs> we don't have unlimited resources and we can't issue passports willy-nilly. There's a great deal, as you can imagine, background checks, checking with files and all that to make sure that it's done properly and the people who should have them are the ones who have them. Last, and, and perhaps not really um, at the foremost thought of most Americans when thinking about the State Department, but very much in our mind, is, is we are the official face of Washington abroad. Now, there are many Americans who live overseas, and their interactions with foreigners in their own countries truly constitute the, the essence of bilateral relations, relations between the United States and any foreign country. But in terms of the official presence, when they look at what does the American government really have to say, it's the foreign service officers, the diplomats who are over there interacting that are that face. And so we take very seriously the need to present a, a respectful and a respected and a friendly and a, uh, an informed and uh, uh, presentation to foreign countries and make sure that we are acting in the ways that the President, Secretary of State, Congress expects us to act on and that we faithfully implement U.S. foreign policy as they determine it. Okay, how big an agency are we? Um, some people feel that the United States State Department and foreign assistance and all that must be a huge part of the budget. Actually, if you look at that international affairs little teeny blue strip up there, that's the entire U.S. foreign affairs budget. One percent of the U.S. budget. Um, foreign affairs or foreign assistance is even a fraction of that, and the State Department's budget is a fraction of that. I don't know if you've studied the U.S. budget, but the three big components by far are Social Security, Medicare, and Department of Defense. All the other agencies put together don't equal what any of those equals by itself. So we're small, but we like to think we punch above our weight. We, um, in the military, you talk about getting deployed, and it's a big deal when you go, and it is a big deal. We're always deployed. Most of our careers we spend overseas manning the embassies and consulates around the world. There are 275 posts around the world, embassies, consulates, and diplomatic missions in over 190 countries. Um, the most recent embassy that was opened was in Havana, Cuba. You may be aware of that. We are also the United States government representatives to international organizations such as NATO, the United Nations, the Organization of American States, OECD, the African Union. And, uh, and various others. All of our postings are either in Washington, D.C., working at the State Department headquarters, or we have two assignments that are international in nature, but in fact are in the United States. 
that is to the Organization of American States, which is in Washington, D.C., and to the United Nations, of course, in New York. So we man those operations as well. When I was at the War College, the National Defense University, uh, we were interacting with our colleagues from the Department of Defense on a daily basis. And uh, if you're in the Department of Defense, you think a lot about your assets. How many aircraft carrier battle groups do you have? How many squadrons of fighters? How, you know, how, the, how big a uh, troop deployments you might have? The State Department, our assets are our people. We have people and places to house them overseas. To keep them safe, we spend uh, sometimes a lot of money keeping embassies safe, but we don't really have any other assets than the people, so we take them very seriously. But in the realm of you know, government work, uh, where there are you know, two and a half million government employees in the federal government alone, we're pretty small. The Foreign Service has only about 13, 14,000 people. Most of them are what we call generalists, which are the standard diplomat, like, like I was, and we'll get a little more detail on that later. We also have specialists, people who do security, people who know how to build buildings, people who run the computers, um, and so you have opportunities for specialists who have those sorts of skills, as well as what we call generalists. And when we get in, in just a moment into um, entry into the State Department, you'll see where, uh, what kinds of majors and minors we're really looking for when you come into the State Department. At any rate, um, by far the largest contingent of the State Department is actually <clears throat> employees working overseas who are foreign nationals. There are some countries who don't allow foreign nationals to work in their embassies. Typically, this has been communist countries, people, countries who were very worried about their security. The Soviet Union never had anybody, but Soviets, Chinese were the same, all the way down to the cooks and the janitors they would bring over people from China. Our perspective is different. First of all, that would be extremely expensive to bring over Americans to do all those sorts of things. But more importantly than that, we want to interact with foreigners. We, you know, we have certain classified information which is closely guarded and kept only for Americans with a need to know, obviously. But generally, our embassies are, are pretty open. And we have foreigners, uh, foreign nationals working in those embassies. And some of my best experiences were in dealing with the foreign nationals. You obviously, it's a window into the foreign country itself. It's an opportunity to practice your language. And uh, that's how we organize ourselves. All right, well, let's talk about foreign service officers and how you might get in. If you are interested in the State Department, do you want to go to state.gov? and go to careers, and they will give you tons of information. When I joined the Foreign Service, there was no information like that. But uh, now there's a, a plethora of information available. You begin the process by taking a written exam. And if you pass that exam, then you go on to an, uh, qualifications. They, they make you write an essay to really hone, make sure you've got good language skills in English, first of all. Then you have what's called a, an oral assessment. And you go in for half a day with a group of other, others who are interested in the State Department. And they'll run you through a battery of tests, uh, group tests. They, you know, they'll give you a problem and work on it, see how well you work together, see how well you can handle the information. Meanwhile, the mentors will be sitting around taking notes and, and all that. And, uh, and uh, I, I remember when I went in for mine, I was so intimidated. I thought, there is no way in the world I'm going to pass this. But hey, it, uh, this will be a great life experience no matter what happens, and so I'll just take it easy and, you know, and have fun. And maybe it was that relaxed manner that kept me from making too many mistakes because I was nervous, and, uh, and indeed, I passed. So it is possible. It is possible. Um, there are a few foreign languages. Well, let me back up a little bit. When I joined the Foreign Service, it was kind of odd, if you thought about it. 
if you had ever lived abroad, if you had ever spoken a foreign language, uh, that didn't give you any leg up on joining the Foreign Service. The applications process was blind to any of that experience. And the reason for it was that if you allowed people to represent America only being those or giving a preference to those who speak foreign languages and have lived abroad, you would have ended up with a Foreign Service filled with um, up middle and upper class whites. That's just what you'd end up with. And indeed, for many decades, that's what it was. Well, in the effort to have the Foreign Service better represent the United States of America, and rather than just one segment of the population, they had to do away with those things. And so it's, it's very, a very colorblind process, and, and indeed there's uh, you know, real opportunities for those who haven't traditionally been able to join the Foreign Service. But at any rate, that has morphed a little bit in the course of my career because foreign language experience is just too valuable not to take into consideration at some extent. And there are just a handful of languages, Chinese, Arabic, I can't remember just what other ones, where if you speak those at a certain level of competence, you will get extra points on your score. And um, let me mention how that works. So if you pass the written, and you pass the orals, and you pass the essay, then you have to do a medical and security background check. And if you pass all that, then you are, all of those things give you a certain point total. And then they have a roster in the State Department. And you're put on that roster, rank ordered according to how many points you've, you've, you've gotten. You stay on that roster for 18 months. And when they're opening a new class for Foreign Service officers, they will start at the top and go down and interview or offer jobs to people until they fill down that class. Now, constantly, the, the list is changing as more people come on to it. So that's, that's you know, never a changing thing. But if you haven't got a job offer for 18 months, you drop off the end and you have to start all over again. But as it comes down, you know, you, you never quite know. And, um, but now, if you speak a foreign language, you will get a few extra points that can bump you up and sometimes can make the difference on whether you will get a job offer in, during the time that you're on the roster. So, so the generalists have, are divided into five cones, political, economic, management, public diplomacy, and consular. I was in the economic cone, but in fact spent a lot of my career doing political work as well. And in the field, the difference between the two isn't all that great. Both are basically reporting jobs. A lot of what you do in those two areas is like an investigative journalist. You want to find out what's going on. So you make contacts, you go meet people, you talk to people all above board. None of this is covert. The other guys do all the covert stuff. We're strictly, strictly above board. Um, but still develop a lot of really good on-the-ground information we get that information and that analysis and report it back to Washington a lot. We send daily reports sometimes, depending on, on the topic and the issue and the interest in, in Washington on, a, on the, on the uh, issues. So um, once you're in the State Department, you have to learn foreign languages. That's something that has to be done. You have to have mastered at least one language before you can get tenure. Okay, and tenure, once you get tenure, then you're basically in unless you really screw up until you retire. And that's usually four or five years into the process. The, um, <clears throat> the selection process is usually pretty good. Most people make tenure once you get in. All right, uh, this is a presentation I gave in um, back at the War College, and so we, thought it fun to compare our ranks to the military. And in <clears throat> actually, the State Department is organized more like the military than like the civil service, because each one of our ranks corresponds directly to a military rank, as you can see up there. Um, a, just as in the military, a full, successful career would have you finishing after 20 or 30 years at an FSO-1. And if circumstances allow and you do particularly well, you might be able to get up into the flag ranks, which is just like in the military. Let me um, quickly move on. Um, 
Our embassies do a lot of stuff I've talked about already. Let's get this one up here. Interact with those government, prepare and send economic reports in. We promote U.S. business. I spend a lot of time working with U.S. business people overseas. Um, protecting American citizens, visa and passport services. We also do public diplomacy and cultural programs, a lot of opportunities for American artists and, and uh, authors and that to go overseas and give presentations there. Back in the Department of State, uh, we are organized in two ways, either in regional bureaus, different parts of the world, or in functional bureaus, in which concentrate on refugees or arms control or trade or something like that. Okay, now, I asked my wife to come with me today because while any career that you get has implications for your family, particularly if you are gonna be traveling a lot or working late hours or have to move from city to city, but rarely do you get a career that has the impact on the family that the Foreign Service does because not only are you going overseas, your family is going too. And they are going to live that life just like you are. And so consideration of the family and the opportunity to live overseas is a big part of what anybody should prudently be thinking about before they uh, think about a career in the State Department. Well, as I mentioned, um, it's a fun career. You travel to exotic climes, meet interesting people. That's me as a young man on the Amazon. Down there, I'm talking to John Huntsman. Over here, well, it's a terrible picture. My wife and I are at the, at the, um, uh, the beginning point of the Nile River in Africa. So you get to see a lot of cool stuff, meet a lot of cool people, meet a lot of interesting people. But not only do you get to do that as an officer, it's going to be that sort of an experience for your family as well. And uh, the picture on the left there is just in front of our apartment one day, some elephants were going by, and so our kids went out and took a look at that. And they obviously hike around interesting places and get into local festivals. And they go to school and graduate overseas from high school. This is both of my daughters graduated from the International School of Beijing. And these schools overseas are, um, it's basically a private school education, typically has very high quality teachers, very high quality programs, international baccalaureate programs, and all that, depending on the size of the school. But perhaps the most important thing is that the students that your children interact with are from all over the world, and they make friends from all over the world. And they develop attitudes of openness and understanding and, uh, you know, and a, and a, an appreciation for different cultures that is just really hard to match. My daughter, um, who now lives in the United States back in Maryland, she is still in close touch with her seven friends from high school that they graduated together with. And she was the first of them to get married because she's LDS. And, uh, <laughs> but all the rest of them have now gotten married. And so she and all the rest of them fly to wherever that person is getting married, and uh, usually around Europe, um, tough call, but you know, and to, to visit them and, and, enjoy, and uh, participate in, in their weddings. And uh, it's just, that's her worldview, is that people are all over the world who are connected to them. The most important consideration for a successful career in the State Department is how happy is your spouse going to be dragged around the world? And <clears throat> the biggest challenge is nowadays, when, when we joined the Foreign Service, it was still sort of traditional that men were working, women were at home. That's changed a lot now, and even in our day, it was changing a lot. But the biggest challenge is that as you're going around the world following your job, how easy is it for your, your spouse, husband or wife, to stay employed? State Department has done a lot of work to try and create opportunities for spouses to work in the embassies and to get working permits for the local company country. So if you want to work, it's not that difficult in most places. The question is, are you going to be able to maintain and continue a career? If you're a lawyer, are you going to be able to do legal work throughout that career? 
or are you just going to be able to get jobs that may be interesting but may not all come together in a career? So that's something that every, every couple has to work on. Now, we've known um, LDS couples. She's in the Foreign Service. He's the trailing spouse or vice versa. Um, it's also possible in the State Department for both husband and wife to be um, in the Foreign Service. We call those tandem couples. For reasons of nepotism and that, it's sometimes hard to get assignments in the same place, though. So it's, it's a challenge, but all those opportunities are out there. In addition to that, um, didn't get on the right picture. There are many other things that spouses can do. Um, my wife worked for some time in the embassy uh, when we first uh, got married in Bogota, but since then she's found that really too dull and has done other things more and more interesting. And um, I'll let her talk about these a little bit, but just quickly up here in the left, this is a group of uh, refugees that she taught English to, and many of them were church members, and so she taught them how to give talks in church. They had newly joined the church, and wonderful experience helping these refugees there. And down here in the left, I should probably turn off these lights, that she is a docent in the National Museum of Bangkok, of Thailand, and gave tours around that, um, which involved a great deal of you know, learning about archaeology and art and history and everything. And then up here, she is kind of hard to see, but um, she organized singing groups. And this is one performance they had where they're all doing things with hats. Jeannie, what do you want to say about what it was like? I thought you did a fine job. <laughs> I, just think, I, I totally agree with Robert. Don't be, going overseas, find the spouse that's going to enjoy being overseas because you meet people who really love being married but aren't in the right country. They shouldn't be overseas. And, um, and some people don't know. I didn't know. I'd never been overseas before. Well, I had, I had three. But, um, um, but in England, and that yeah. really doesn't count. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Open for questions. We can probably turn the lights on again, unless you like looking at these pictures. I kind of like it, but questions, comments. Yes. What's like a well, I'm supposed to tell you to use the mic so that your words can be electronically preserved forever. <laughs> so think about that too when you uh, make your comments. <laughs> What's a typical background of like a foreign service ah, officer? Thank you. I was meant to say more about that. The <clears throat> there are certain majors that are required for entry into the foreign service. They are all majors. <laughs> there is no no difference. Now the fact of the matter is, if you've studied history, economics. Um, international relations, maybe political science, you probably will be a little bit more prepared for the written exam than somebody who had no background in any of those areas. But you can go on their website and look at the exam questions and get a feel for what they're looking for. But the fact of the matter is, anybody who's been keeping up with current events, has a good general liberal arts education, is probably going to be in fine shape in terms of getting through the exam process in the State Department. Once in the State Department, hey, you know, any sort of background that people have is going to be made use of. Um, you know, when I had people coming in, new officers working for me, I always want to know, okay, what did you do before the State Department? What, what background have you have? What have you done that's interesting? And try to use that to say, good, I'd like you to have this assignment to get to know that group because you're going to be able to have something in common with them. Maybe it's a bunch of doctors, maybe it's lawyers, maybe it was something else. But... Um, so any background really will work. But go onto the website and look at the questions on the exam because you've got to get past that exam first and see what kinds of things they're looking at. It's mainly current events, American history, some economics, not high-level stuff, political science generally, stuff like that, as you would expect in national relations. But you know, don't, don't freak out if it isn't in your major because you might find that you could do perfectly well in the exam without that. Um, how, I mean, do you ever get any kind of time off to 
for holidays or anything? Or are you just always in the country, a la mission? I, I, that is such a leading question. The fact of the matter is, it's great for holidays because as a federal employee, you get all the federal holidays. And since you're in a foreign country and everything's closed anyway, you tend to get all the local holidays too. <laughs> and so actually we do very well on holidays. And in addition to that, between assignments, the State Department for some reason is worried that we're going to lose touch with our roots. And so you get about four weeks between every assignment to go home. But you have to go home. You can't go flittering around other countries on vacation, club med, no. You go home for four weeks every year, every, between every assignment. And assignments come one to three years. So actually, uh, State Department, if you're not all the way already this way, you will become this way inveterate travelers and avid tourists. Thank you. Uh oh, he's bringing his computer to ask his question. <laughs> So I just had a question based off that. Um, so you say go home for four weeks. Mm -hmm. Spending so much time overseas, do you find it like valuable to have a stable home in the United States? Um, excellent question. Um, it is certainly true, probably not so much now as back when we started and you, know, you left for three years and you know, except for a long distance phone call, you, know, you communicated by letters. Does anybody know what a letter is? <laughs> You know, you didn't have all the electronic stuff that you do now. And, and we would come home after three years and say, wow, what's, where did that have, you know, how that's that changed, you know? And, uh, but nowadays it's not too much because you're really well plugged in. And, um, but it, it's, you have to actually tell the State Department where you're from and you have a home leave address and that's where you have to go. I mean, you can travel around from there, but that's where they will pay for you to go between every assignment. And um, I don't know if this was part of your question or not, but do you want to own a home while you're overseas? Do you want to you know, have, try to maintain uh, a life back home, or do you just want it to be where your parents live or where your brother and sister live and that's where you'd like to go to or, or something like that? And that's all, there's no real answer to that. Uh, every family situation is different. Some own homes and rent them out. If you own a home in a Washington, D.C. area, it's easy to rent it out. And we, we owned homes the whole time we were in Washington, D.C. and rented them out without any difficulty at all. And they, that paid the mortgage and that was, you know, our salaries are adequate, perfectly adequate, but you're not gonna get rich in the Foreign Service unless you own a home in Washington, D.C., and I would appreciate and somebody else pay the rent and they sell the home, and then you can get some real money. And that's what we did. <laughs> so we've now built a house in Provo because of the house we sold in Washington, D.C. Yes? So this question has less to do with the State Department and, and is more to do with your experiences in the State Department. Um, so, in your opinion, what impact has American ideology had on the evolution of various cultures around the world? And then also, how do you see the current climate in the White House affecting um, the nature of that global culture? Okay, great questions. Um, it's hard to imagine that you guys weren't alive then, but you know, the, the Soviet Union collapsed in 1990, and that really seemed to everyone to be a victory of American-led um, freedom, open markets, free economics, democracy over Soviet communism. And that uh, sort of the beacon on the hill, if you were, that America uh, provided all through the Cold War seemed to have been vindicated. And today there are only four communist countries in the world Back then, about a third of the world was under communist rule. Today, you have continuing challenges from all sorts of authoritarian regimes around the world, um, under which some of them can be as oppressive as communism was back in its day. And um, the thing that, in my experience, is key here is for Americans, first of all, to be humble enough to recognize that they're not going to change foreign countries. As much as we might 
you know, preach at them, give them foreign aid, give them programs, stuff like that. We are not going to change foreign countries. But that's not to say that we don't have an impact on them. We don't have an influence. But our influence is, by and large, our example. America is not only an open country for us, but it's open to be seen from the entire world. And so when we're doing our thing well, we have a tremendous influence on the world. Not that we're going to control what's going on around the world, but that people are drawn to America, American values, and want to see how they can incorporate some of that into their own lives back home. And then each of them then faces those challenges. In terms of the current administration, I'm retired from the Foreign Service <laughs> and um, don't really have a good insight into that. If I was still working in the department, I would have a good feel for that. You know, like you, I've read the papers. The State Department isn't doing real well right now. Some people in the White House don't seem to have understood what the State Department was or what it did and haven't made as full of use from it as presidents always have in the past. But, um, but regardless of where you are on the ideological spectrum, just remember this point. Whatever America is doing has influence in the world for good or ill just because of the nature of the society that we are, the role that we've always played in the world. Not that we're going to change the world, but we influence the world by our example. That's you. Yeah. Okay. Right to the mic. Does do foreign languages that you already speak have any impact on where you, you where you're stationed? Yes, um, but you have to fight for it. Um, State Department, because people come into the State Department not necessarily having foreign languages. The State Department. This is one of the really great benefits. They'll teach you a foreign language. Not only pay for it, but they'll pay you your salary while you're doing it. And this can be from you know, four or five months up to two years. I mean, it's an incredible, incredible benefit if you're interested in foreign languages. Once you're in the State Department, um, every, job is, it's, every job is open, and you can see what the requirements are for experience level, for expertise level, and for language requirements. And so, you know, my whole career was spent scouting out where I th thought I could go. And when I had prior language experience, as I did from my mission and from other study, you know, I would zero in on that and try to get in before they had to assign it to somebody else that they'd have to train two, lang two years for and spend a lot of money doing it and make that pitch. If you speak the language well, it's really an asset. If you don't necessarily speak it all that well, then you're probably going to be just fighting out with all the people who are going to go through regular language training. But every job in the State Department, I mean, if you sit back and do nothing, the State Department will just assign you someplace. But in the real world, you're always looking for your next assignment. And you lobby for it, and you build networks, and you try to do that to get the jobs that you want. The first two assignments are assigned. But yeah, some, even then you can give preferences. But after that, you, you work hard to get the jobs that you wanted. And I you know, was really very successful in that way. For example, I wanted to make sure there was a place for, that would be good for my kids, that the schools were good. But, I, but you know, knowing that that was usually cushy posts, well, you have, to, you have to have some sacrifice as well. So when we didn't need schools, you know, we went to dangerous places and undeveloped places and all that sort of, have that sort of that, uh, stock in the bank, if you would. So when I said, yeah, now I want to go to you know, a nice place, um, I say, you know, I've already served these not so nice places, then you have a lot, of, um, a lot more impact. When we first went to Shanghai, it was a hardship post, and, we, you know, and it, was, it was not that hard to get assigned there. Now <laughs> it's one of the premier cities in the world, and people are falling over themselves to get there. But if you speak Chinese well, you'll definitely have a leg up. Thanks. Anything else? If not, the lure of dinner is triumphing, and I'll call it, call it there. Thank you very much. Thank you.